center of this uh, session. What we are going to deal with is the future of peace in the Middle East. Uh, let me thank, actually, uh, going to be my uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, having that kind of a well-organized and very interesting uh, conference uh, under the auspices of the Hassan Institute. Um, and uh, what we are going to have here is uh, three uh, presentations on different topics. But basically, while talking about the future of peace in the Middle East, I think that all of them are right to the point. Uh, we in the Middle East uh, do experience kind of a tumultuous change in the recent year. Uh, 2011 uh, actually brought in uh, a wave of what we call revolutions in the Middle East. Uh, the scholarly literature depicted the changes as the uh, Arab Spring. Well, there are many who would argue against that uh, um, in terms of name and spirit and the whole logic behind that term. But basically what we uh, are having in mind while talking about the Arab Spring is that a new situation was created uh, in the Middle East uh, as a result or byproduct of the Arab uh, Spring. It has to do with the geopolitical landscape. It has to do with the political culture of states. It has to do with a lot of things. But since we are uh, here in order to discuss the uh, prospect of peace and the future of peace in the Middle East, we have decided to focus on three main topics. The first of which would be the Syrian-Israeli complex. As you know, there have been many dealings and negotiations between Israel and Syria uh, in the last, let's say, two decades, even less than that. But it remains to be seen uh, where do we stand now? What is the prospect of peace uh, actually providing that what we do have in Syria is a real upheaval? And the first presenter uh, is my colleague uh, of bar -Ilan University in Israel, Professor Rami Ginat, who is uh, uh, an expert on uh, Egypt and Syria, has written a lot about those two states and their uh, history and uh, the societal dynamic and uh, uh, a lot of other things that are related to these countries, uh, but also dealt with the Syrian-Israeli negotiations, Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, and uh, I think he is uh, well fit to, uh, to, to discuss the issue, and he will be the first presenter. So what we are going to do is just I'll introduce the presenters one by one. So uh, without further ado, let's move to the first presentation. Professor Ginat, please. Thank you very much. In my short presentation, I will try actually to focus on two things actually, which I think are very important to understand the current state of affairs of the Israeli-Syrian relations. Uh, the first one is actually I'm going to uh, uh, discuss the causes for the current labyrinth in uh, Israeli-Syrian uh, relations. And what then to discuss the prospects to revitalize this current stalemate that we are actually experiencing. Then the second thing I will discuss actually the, um, uh, the, the current policy of the Israeli government or the, 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 the chances, the prospects for any change in terms of Israel's policy towards Syria following the development, the current development of events. The, uh, in Syria and the issue of what will happen if Bashar al-Assad is out of power. To start with, I would actually want to focus, to explain what were the reasons for the labyrinths between, in the uh, peace talks between Israel and Egypt, in the Syria. The main issue is what I argue is the question of uh, legitimacy. The Alawi regime took power in Syria 
1966, after a coup, military coup, is actually based on a very tiny minority, which the Alawi community, which was behind uh, the leaders, came from the army. Uh, after that, it turned out to be the, the rule of the Ba'ath Party. Uh, and the, um, the situation was quite difficult because until 1966, Syria was ruled most of the time, by the, all the time, by the Sunni, which constituted the majority of the population. And suddenly, by military means, the Alawi community took over and ruled the country. So there was a problem of the base of its legitimacy, which was very, very fragile. The uh, domestically, this change was reflected in the uh, implementation of radical social policy of uh, uh, socialism, and uh, the, the new rulers actually felt very isolated, uh, both domestically and uh, externally. Uh, the Ba'ath Party, which was the ruling party, the only party that existed, still exists, the ruling party, notwithstanding its endeavor to broaden its base and gain popular support, had now clearly become a minority party ruled by the uh, Alawi military elite. The Sunni Muslims often expressed feelings of discontent and hostility towards the new rulers and this led to, uh, actually they considered them, the, the Alawi, as infidels. And this led to a very major uh, discontent, an anti-regime regime un uprising uh, which took place in Hama and led to a massacre during which tens of thousands of Sunni Muslims actually were killed by Hafez al-Assad forces. Like father, like son, his Bashar al-Assad followed suit. He has been engaged in a systematic mass killing over a long period of time in many parts of the country. And if he continued, he might break his father's dubious record in terms of death toll. Ever since the Hama massacre in 1982, Hafez al-Assad continued to employ repressive and ferocious tactics, he generally speaking, managed to uproot Sunni opposition. What we're experiencing now, what we call the Arab Spring and its immediate success in Egypt and Tunisia, was to have a significant impact on the awakening of the Syrian uh, Sunnis. The Hama effect gradually faded away and gave rise to new hopes. Bashar al-Assad appeared to be confident that his regime is quite immunized. He <clears throat> is patronizing and self-content statements following Mubarak's downfall appeared to be a short-sighted vision. A few weeks later, in March 2011, anti-government protests actually in the town of Dara marked the starting of a Sunni uprising nationwide. As a result of the ongoing bloodbath against Sunni Syrians orchestrated by his regime and his Praetorian army, if we employed Amos Perlmutter's phrase, <coughs> the elite lost basically the final vestiges of its legitimacy to rule democratic, domestically and externally. Although there are still in its existence, it still rely on foreign anchors such as Iran and Russia, but basically it's gradually losing its grip and I think uh, the legitimacy factor, as I mentioned before, has played a crucial role, if we're going back to its relations, Syrian-Israeli relations, played a crucial fact factor in the elite's inability and moreover unwillingness to strike a peace deal with Israel. 
in order to understand the situation, one is to go back to what happened in 1967 and the major Syrian defeat. Syria lost not only the Golan Heights in 1967, but it lost also territories that its army occupied in 1948, during the 1948 war, which belonged to Israel and actually be, were part of the uh, mandatory Palestine at the time. So basically, the Syrians actually ruled, controlled before 1967 territories that part of them were actually belonged to Israel. Now, because it's this issue of legitimacy, whenever they actually entered into negotiation with Israel, particularly in the 1990s and few of them also later in the 21st century, they always came to the point that, you know, basically were about to strike a deal or not, what we call to come to, you know, to put the finger and sign, there was an issue of these territories that actually they demanded back, not only the international border, but they wanted also these territories that belonged to Israel. The reasons for that is they could not, and I don't think they, they, they were actually willing to, give in these territories because they lost it in the 1967, and the majority, the Syrian majority of Syrians, wouldn't accept such an agreement which based on territories that actually Syria lost. So whenever the negotiations appear to be just a matter of, you know, within a matter of time with some deal, things went wrong and they withdrew. And that was the situation until, actually until now. Now, the, what's happening now, the uprising and the loss of the final vestiges of legitimacy in Syria made things even more complicated for them. So in this regard, I don't think that this regime in Syria, even if managed to survive, will be able to strike a peace deal with Israel. Uh, the other thing that also important to understand is that the situation in Israel at the moment is that in Israel there's a government that representing the right and this government at the moment is not particularly willing to make any concessions or to withdraw from the Golanites even to the international borders of 1923. Unlike previous governments, the Rabin government and others who were willing to do so, Barak, uh, in the previous negotiations. So in order to kind of break this stalemate we are facing at the moment, we need a regime change in Syria, obviously, and a democratically elected government that will represent the majority of the people that will be able to make such concessions. They will have to understand that even the most moderate government in Israel will not be able to withdraw to the pre-1967 borders, which means borders that include territories that belong to Israel. So obviously, what we have to actually follow is the formula determined or created during the uh, peace treaty with Egypt, which meant with full Israeli withdrawal to the pre-1967 international borders. In Egypt, we had a small dispute over a very tiny territory called Taba, and the parties could not agree what to do with this territory. The Egyptians claimed that it's theirs, Israel said it's ours. Eventually they went to an international arbitration that determined that these territories belong to Egypt. Why? Because it was based on the 1906 treaty agreement between the Ottoman Empire and the British. So basically what determined eventually is the international line. It's the same actually also when Israel withdrew from Lebanon in 2000. It was the same, the same story. What determined at the end was the international border based on 1923. So, in this regard, I, I would say the uh, Israeli government, the current Israeli government, if they want to negotiate with a democratically elected uh, Syrian government, they will have to understand that 
concessions are to be made and the international border is the one to be determined. If not, if there are going to be disputes over these tiny territories that occupied by the Syrians in 1948, to my mind, the best way to deal with it is to take it to international arbitration like they did in the case of Egypt and let them decide. And I think Israel should not, shouldn't have any fears. These territories actually belong to her by law, by the international law. So this is the reason why I think they should not fear and carry on with it. And uh, this is the formula, to, to conclude it, my formula for any future solution to this conflict is that democratically elected Syrian government that represent the vast majority of Syria, first thing. Second, an Israeli government that is willing to make concessions, that is to go to withdraw to the international borders, and any conflicts, any disputes over territories should be dealt with by international arbitration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ginat, for this uh, uh, well-delivered and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we will uh, save some time for a Q&A discussion thereafter. But uh, uh, from Syria, we are moving to the Israeli-Palestinian arena, another arena which really needs a, a breakthrough. And uh, our presenter is uh, Dr. Ephraim Levy. Dr. Ephraim Levy is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center in Tel Aviv University. He is also the director of the Tamish Taimet Center for uh, Peace and uh, uh, Regional Conflicts. Uh, I think that what uh, uh, Dr. Levy brings in is a kind of a combination of uh, uh, experience that is being gleaned from the ground he is a retired colonel of the IDF, but he was there in the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, uh, let us say 15 or maybe even, uh, I would say, Ephraim 10 years ago and, and more than that. Uh, but also, uh, Dr. Ephraim Lavi, of course, is an academician who wrote a lot about the uh, Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, and uh, we thought it would be very, very useful to have his remarks and thoughts about the uh, ongoing Palestinian-Israeli stalemate and what should be done in order to get, as I said before, a breakthrough and promote uh, a kind of a, I don't know if a comprehensive peace or an interim agreement, but we need really a breakthrough and we thought that it would be very, very useful to have Ephraim Levy's remarks. Uh, Dr. Levy, please. Thank you, Uzi. Uh, the title of my lecture is The Palestinian Independence Spring in Light of the Arab Spring. Uh, although the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, and Israel reached an agreement nearly 20 years ago where they both accepted the principle of a two-state solution, it seems that they are far from achieving this goal. In my lecture, I will briefly describe main political developments on the Palestinian side and then try to estimate how the continued deadlock in the peace process could affect the stability and the future of peace between uh, Israel and the Palestinians uh, in light of the Arab Spring. So uh, following the Oslo Accord signed by Israel and the PLO in 1993, uh, the PLO, led by Fatah, uh, the largest national movement, succeeded in establishing the Palestinian National Authority in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the two uh, separated areas that uh, were occupied by Israel during the War of 1967, and are considered one geographical unit of the future Palestinian state. But the PLO wasn't able to reach a political agreement with Israel concerning the establishment of an uh, independent state and solve the problem of the Palestinian refugees. A few years before the Oslo Accords, an Islamic movement of Muslim brothers called Hamas was established as a political alternative to the PLO. 
Hamas offered the Palestinian people a different ideology than the Fatah. Unlike Fatah, Hamas was against Israel's right to exist and called to liberate all of Palestine by jihad, a holy and Muslim religious war. Due to Fatah's failure to achieve the Palestinians' national goal, uh, Hamas gained more and more uh, popularity and won the 2006 general elections. As a result, the PLO lost its legitimacy as the only legal representative of the Palestinians. Following these elections, a violent dispute ensued between Hamas and Fatah over who would rule the Palestinian Authority and divided the Palestinians in the summer of 2007 into two separate political entities, one in the West Bank and one in the Gaza Strip. Since then, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, ruled by Fatah, managed to maintain law and order, conduct successfully uh, security coordination with Israel, and to carry out a state-building policy, all with generous uh, financial assistance uh, from the international uh, community. At the same time, Hamas preferred to build an Islamic entity in Gaza Strip while enjoying economic and military aid from Iran and rejecting the preconditions of the International Quartet on the Middle East to recognize Israel and accept the agreements signed by PLO and Israel. This was the Palestinian political situation at the end of 2010 when the Arab Spring began, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas feared that popular protest might break out against them as well. Neither had legitimacy to remain in power due to the fact that they are split into two separate governments and that their term had ended over two years. <clears throat> Fatah and Hamas were quick to use the internet media and social networks to prove that they are not disconnected from the public and to ensure that social networks will not be used against them. They sought to channel the energy, of, uh, the energy potential of the younger population against the Israeli occupation and to put an end to the internal split. <coughs> In this context, the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas Prime Minister Ismail Aniyeh called for a national dialogue and rushed to sign a re reconciliation agreement in Cairo in May 2011. At the same time, the Palestinian Authority believed that the continued impasse in the peace process could cause despair and cynicism uh, that could result in popular unrest exactly like the protests in the Arab world which were not driven by the power of any political ideology or political party. The Palestinian Authority developed a comprehensive strategy to address this uh, situation. One, they would appeal to the UN despite US and the Israeli objections so that the international community would have to, ex to accept responsibility for the Palestinian question. And two, they would recruit young Palestinians to gain their support for the political struggle in achieving the international recognition for a Palestinian state. The Palestinian Authority uh, hoped that the UN recognition of a Palestinian state within the 67 borders would force Israel to negotiate on the basis of these borders or force her to withdraw from the occupied territory. The UN appeal was presented as the beginning of the Palestinian independence spring. They launched a campaign called Palestine State Number 194 in order to convince the world public opinion that the Palestinians aspire to future of freedom, dignity, and prosperity in their own independent state, and that the Palestinians' membership uh, in the UN is in line with the rules of international law and the principles of peace process. 
However, this strategy gave next to nothing results. The UN Security Council recommended that the Quartet maximize their efforts in finding an agreed formula to renew negotiations between Israel and Palestinians. Attempts, attempts made by the Quartet, including the subsequent talks in Jordan, failed. Seemingly, the main uh, obstacles in reaching such a formula are the Israeli rejection to returning to the 67 borders and the Palestinians' refusal to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Actually, these obstacles reflect a more profound re uh, reason. Both sides are unable to reach political decisions regarding territorial uh, compromises. These stems uh, from their views concerning how each views its rights over the land. The situation is intensified from a religious point of view. Jews see the greater land of Israel as the land that was promised to them by God. According to Hamas views, the same land, Palestine, is a holy Islamic land and there is no authority to any Muslim Arab leader to negotiate with Israel over this land. Today, President Abbas and his government are trying to justify the uh, confrontational political line that they chose uh, last September. They are trying to prove that it was correct and effective and so uh, they emphasize uh, their success of last October uh, being accepted as a state member in UNESCO. But these explanations uh, do not convince the Palestinian people that there is a hope uh, in this policy. Uh, they realize that the idea of a two-state solution appears less practical than ever, and the one-state solution is becoming more of a reality. This old original Palestinian vision of one uh, state solution uh, was used during the last uh, decade more, the, uh, more as a means of threat to Israel when there was no progress in the peace process rather than as a, a real political program. Today, this idea is being used with greater emphasis by various factors both in the region and abroad. Paradoxically, the religious parties in Israel and Hamas in the Palestinian side both currently support the one-state option because both sides refuse to divide the Holy Land. But senior politicians from various wings in Israel, as well as the Palestinian leaders, leadership, are strongly against formation, the formation of a one-state reality. As a result, they are calling on Israel to hurry up and push the two-state solution forward and convince the inter international uh, uh, community that this option is still relevant. In contrast, Hamas M is to prevent a return to the slippery political slope of the Oslo process that reduced the Palestinian problem to the areas of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And it is against the Arab League uh, peace initiative that adopted the principle of peace for territories. Unlike Hamas, the PLO actually accepted this Arab initiative immediately after it was announced 10 years ago. The initiative was aimed to, at encourage, encouraging Israel to reach peace agreements with the Palestinians, the Syrians, and the Lebanese, and thus be accepted by the Arab world and enjoy peaceful relations with everyone. The initiative was an historic transformation in the Arab uh, position towards Israel. It is still valid and can be used as a basis for restarting the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. But the question is whether the leaders uh, on both sides can deliver the goods. It seems that the Palestinian leadership is unable to restore a national unity and make the necessary concessions on the core issues of a final status. 
At the same time, the right, the right wing government in Israel is unable to make needed uh, compromises in negotiations for both ideology, ideological uh, and security reasons, especially as long as the geopolitical uh, situation in the Middle East is not clear. Uh, to sum things up, a history has shown that uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis are not on the same page. It is likely that in light of the intern internal political difficulties on both sides and the absence of an agreed formula for renewing the peace process, the political deadlock and the occupation are expected to continue. The reality is that the clock is ticking against both sides. Although the current situation is stable, things can definitely get out of hand. And if a Palestinian uprising breaks out against Israel once more, sooner or later it will become a violent confrontation which can lead to the collapse of the Palestinian Authority and such developments may well arouse the Arab world public opinion against Israel and affect negatively the stability of the region. I think that Israel uh, and Palestinian leadership must find a way to negotiate and go to the extra miles to reach an agreement. In my opinion, they have no choice. President Abbas uh, declared that if they reach a two-state uh, uh, agreement, that will end the conflict. Uh, such promise along with guarantees from the international community to Israel that it recognizes Israel as a Jewish state can meet the needs of Israel. The international community can also assure the Palestinians that it sees the 67 borders as the borders of the future Palestinian state, that their final borders will be determined through negotiations between the parties. Therefore, such guarantees from the international community might help the parties to resume negotiations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lavi, for another, I think, uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation which uh, provides us all with, I would say, food for thought, and we'll stay with that uh, until the discussion. I'm pretty sure that there will be a lot of comments and questions, and we are here, actually, to um, deal with that. But uh, let's move to the third leg of our session, now we are talking about the economy at large, or let it uh, 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 differently put, what economy has to do with securing peace or how to use economy in order to promote peace initiatives in the region. Uh, our third presenter is uh, uh, Dr. Paul Rivlin. Paul Rivlin is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. He is also the editor of uh, uh, our publication, economic, I mean, which deals with economics and uh, called Ektisadi. Um, this is kind of uh, uh, maybe an opportunity to just, uh, if you would like to have some uh, details or to browse the internet, to visit us uh, virtually at the Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. We do provide a lot of online papers and publications, so you are more than welcome. But uh, Professor uh, Dr. Rivlin is uh, a well-known uh, expert uh, about the e economy of the Middle East. He dealt a lot with uh, uh, issues of energy, uh, gas, oil, and uh, of course uh, has written a lot about uh, those things. Um, he has um, written five books uh, I don't want to delve into too much details, but what you have here is kind of a, a, a really world expert when it comes to the economy of the Middle East, and I'm pretty sure that all of us are pretty enthusiastic to hear what Dr. Rivlin has to say about the future of peace in the Middle East, but how we're going to use economy in order to promote it. Dr. Rivlin, please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, before I talk uh, briefly about economics and peacemaking, 
I think it's um, useful to to summarise the um, the structures around the peace process or the lack of a peace process in the Middle East. And without being an astrologer, I would say that there are a number of um, circles that we have to consider. Firstly, we have to look at the, the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Israelis and the Syrians. And we've heard a great deal about those two aspects of what I call the inner circle. Those are the parties that have to come to agreement. Without them, there's no peace. Then there is a middle circle, what I call the regional circle. And it is the the other Arab states, some of whom are in a state of peace with Israel, such as Jordan and Egypt, um, and others which are don't have full diplomatic relations with Israel but have links with Israel, such as Morocco, Oman, and Qatar, and and then others um, which are really um, not in, involved um, in a positive or active way in the peace process, and then, of course, Iran, which is actively opposing moves towards peace. So what happens in the region and the dynamics of what happens in the region, which are affected by economics a great deal, amongst other things, have their impact on on the Middle East. And then there is what I call the outer circle, which is the rest of the world. And um, the single most important player in that is the United States, obviously, but it's also the single most overrated player in that um, the United States, I think, is itself... Uh, rapidly reaching the conclusion that its influence is less than it used to be or perhaps less than they thought it was. However, I will just note one thing. The United States before elections and the United States after elections is is two different things, especially vis-a-vis a a right-wing Israeli government. And I I, I don't predict anything. Um, I don't know what will happen but I think that um, it's reasonable to assume that um, the game will be different after the elections than before. Um, That outer circle is less affected by by economics in its relations to the Middle East, but um, the the consumption of Middle East energy resources by the rest of the world is a factor that affects this country, the Europeans, the Americans, the Chinese, the Russians, and everybody. Now, what about economics and peacemaking in the Middle East? Uh, The idea that you can have an economic peace um, has been put forward by a number of Israeli leaders and by others. Um, And this idea takes on two forms which are, in a certain sense, opposed to each other and reflect the different philosophies of the Israeli leaders who put them forward. And I'm not going to give names to the people involved. I'll just put forward the ideas. The first is the idea of economics as a prelude to a political solution or as something that would accompany uh, the stages of a political solution. That if you improve economic conditions on the ground, you increase the incentives for people to move towards peace. And this sounds eminently reasonable. Okay? The, 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 The other side is the idea that you can have an economic peace as an alternative to a political peace, that you basically do economic changes, but you don't do political changes, and people will suffice by having uh, improved welfare, and in true Middle Eastern style, uh, as prevails in many countries in the Middle East, you abandon political participation in some way in favour of economic betterment. And um, both of these ideas have been tried, implemented, have succeeded or failed, depending on your philosophy. But I think it's important to note that the the talk about economics comes with different hidden agendas. Um, And you need to look at um, who is saying things and why, even if they're using the same words as somebody else who's saying something, even if it sounds the same, if it comes from a different... uh, political source. It may have a different meaning uh, because it may be part of a different agenda, not one that's necessarily stated. That's why I use the term hidden agenda. Now, what is, what is the economic model? Why, why do we think about economics as um, 
an integral part of peacemaking at all. Well, I'm, not a, I'm only an economist, I'm not a, a theoretician, I'm not a political scientist, but um, I think that from the point of view of an economist, the, the key example is the uh, European Union, the creation of the European Union, which was originally called the European Economic Community. And the impetus for the creation of the European Economic Community in the late 1940s, leading to the Treaty of Rome in 1957, was a French and a French-German initiative to basically uh, turn the page on the past and to build a completely new structure in which um, economics would be used to prevent war. Now, it has to be said, this wasn't just a wonderful, altruistic, future-looking model. The Cold War was developing rapidly in Europe, and the need to secure Western Europe, given the Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe, meant that many old quarrels needed to be put aside. Now, pay attention to those words. Many old quarrels we need to put aside in order to deal with the imperatives of the of the day. That isn't happening in the Middle East. There are imperatives of the day which are apparent to all the people on this panel and many others, but um, old scores are not being put aside. Now, the other part of this lesson that I draw from the European experience, firstly, the, despite the fact that even here we're talking about the Euro crisis, I think makes us uh, we, we shouldn't forget the success of the European Union in its early forms, at least, um, in building prosperity in, in Western Europe. The early years, particularly the 1960s, of the European Economic Community, which became the European Community, which only later became the European Union, were phenomenal. In fact, so much trade was created within that area that it became a growth pole for the world economy, exactly the opposite of what it is today. So economics had tremendous force. And economics has tremendous force, we, we will see, in the Middle East. For example, economics is causing people to move all across the Middle East, even until recently and still into Europe, and across the Middle East from poorer countries into richer countries. Uh, people are leaving Africa. Uh, they're leaving Ethiopia or Eritrea. They're leaving Sudan to try and get to Israel, not because they've become Zionists, but because of the power of uh, economics in getting people to move and find a better future. And I'm sure that people in, in this part of the world are acutely aware of the power of economics in motivating people. Now, this worked in Europe, but my, really, my, my main point this afternoon is that the creation of the European Union, um, as it was really called, the European Economic community was a political decision. There was no move on economic union, unification, or as it used to be called, integration in Europe before a political decision was made. Now, interestingly enough, the political decision, the hardest political decisions were perhaps those of the French, because the French, in a sense, had been defeated in the Franco-Prussian War, in the First World War, and in the Second World War, uh, in 1940 by the Germans. And although they came out uh, on, the, on the, the side of the Allies, the victors in the, the Second World War, it was they who were going to have to approach their long-time enemy, the Germans, and say, look, if we can integrate our uh, steel and iron and coal industries, these key parts of our economies, so they don't compete each other into the ground, but that they, we regulate these industries so that they can cooperate and thrive, then we are going to avoid the threat of unemployment and we're going to avoid the sort of pressures that in the 1920s and 30s led to the rise of Hitler and the Second World War. And that was the imperative. Now there's an imperative in the Middle East, or there was an imperative in the Middle East, or so we thought, which was to build a more secure economic base so as to push extremism out of the way. That whole model, that whole way of thinking has gone because the, the Arab Spring has brought near to power or to power 
the very groups that the old economic model was designed to push away. And we've heard this most clearly in Ephraim's uh, analysis of what has happened uh, with the Palestinians. But really the, the example of Tunisia and the example of Egypt are more shocked because there, unambiguously, um, Muslim parties have won elections. Yes, you can certainly say that um, in, in Gaza, the Muslim party, uh, in a sense, won, won the election in effect. Um, and so the idea that you can use economics to uh, reduce the appeal of extremism seems to be something that we have to put aside or suspend. And then this leads to the question, um, what kind of economic arrangements can be made with um, Muslim parties which may or may not uh, reject Western economic thinking, Western economic rules, which may or may not reject existing peace treaties with Egypt, with Israel, I'm sorry, and other kinds of arrangements between countries such as Tunisia and Israel, and maybe one day Morocco uh, will have a more Islamic regime and face uh, similar issues and so on. Um, maybe a few tips, just a few thoughts on how this can be arranged. Um, in order to, um, in a sense, secure an economic role and uh, demonstrate that peaceful relations between countries are in the net advantage of everybody concerned. Uh, as a result of, of research um, conducted in Israel about uh, the economics of peace, uh, one, of the, one of the things that was uh, pointed out is that it's important that, that gains be even. Um, it's important that, that um, one side is not seen to be gaining much more than the other side, and that's a very th difficult thing to do, because if one party is richer and another party is poorer, then there's going to be an inequality and a resentment, even though peace may push up the party that's weaker faster than it improves things for the party that's richer. But the other thing is that uh, any sort of new economic arrangements should also ben benefit as wide a group uh, in, in any country as possible. If peace is seen to be basically in the interests of a narrow group of, let's say, uh, rich industrialists or whatever, then this can be the focus of resentment. And another slide on this is the idea that you don't create structures that threaten big vested interests in either country. You try to create a pattern of relationships that doesn't create enemies within countries or doesn't divide within countries. Um, and this, I think, is designed to maximize the number of people who might benefit from any other agreement. And my final concluding point is that um, economic development economic development within a region is really based on trade between countries. And trade between countries in economics is based on the notion that it's not a zero-sum game, that everybody gains. Uh, and I think this is something that is understood um, and is now being put up to the test. There was a very interesting debate in Amman some years ago at the World Economic Forum Jordan Summit between the then foreign minister of Egypt, Abu Musa, and King Hussein. Abu Musa said to King Hussein, you mustn't rush into a peace treaty with Israel, you must look after Arab interests. And King Hussein very angrily said in a public meeting like this to Abu Musa, well, the Egyptians can't talk about that because they made a separate peace with Israel a long time ago. And... Uh, they have uh, received all the benefits of doing that and it's time for other Arab countries to follow. So I think the, the idea that there are gains which are not zero-sum, which are shared for all sides, uh, is understood um, and we have to create structures that will allow this to go forward without it obviously uh, benefiting very narrow groups. The Arab Spring has demonstrated to us the force of resentment in not just the Arab world, but elsewhere. And any peace process that goes forward with the economics that implied must be very, very careful on this point as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Rivlin, for this lovely presentation. And uh, we are left with uh, 25 minutes. It's a lot of time. So uh, what we are going to do is just to collect your comments or questions. And um, let's open up the floor for uh, discussion. Please, will you please introduce yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Aaron McKenzie. I'll direct this question, I guess, to Dr. Rivlin. You spoke about the EU as a potential model for the Middle East, um, and you mentioned that eventually the Europeans had managed to put aside their historical disputes towards some sort of future um, peace. But this required at least two world wars and an existential threat by the Soviet Union in order for them to do this. So what I'm wondering is what kind of crisis or what kind of threat will it take for those in the Middle East to finally put aside their historical disputes and come up with some kind of cooperation? Well, I don't think it required two world wars to, for it to happen. It, was, it, was, um, it wasn't, you know, that it was proposed and then the two world wars enabled it to happen. I think it was a response to what had happened. It was a rational response to what had happened. And it's always in a particular set of circumstances. Um, and it, the problem is you can't just copy the event. I mean, the Middle East has had its catastrophes and maybe may be heading towards another one. Uh, who knows? Uh, and it hasn't done it yet. But we do have um, we do have peace treaties between Israel and Egypt. We do have peace treaties between um, Israel and Jordan, and we do have still all sorts of working relationships between Israel and the Palestinians including a significant volume of trade. And these are things that have to be built on. Um, I don't know what will bring about the transformation. Um, it seems that up to now, you know, all the things that have gone wrong and so on uh, haven't brought about that transformation, and some of the things that are going on in the region may actually make, 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 make it harder. One thing that will make it harder, at least initially, is the Arab Spring, because uh, regimes are collapsing, unwinding, being recreated in Arab states, and that's a reason for Israelis to become even more fearful, or you might say paranoid, than, than before. On the other hand, um, if, um, and this is you know, pure speculation, if there's a change of regime in Syria, which seems less likely than it did six months ago, but still can't be uh, ruled out, then um, the whole structure of opposition to a peace, um, which is very, but not exclusively, influenced by Iran, the whole equation can change. And then you may find, and here again it's pure speculation, that the, the forces within Israel and within the Palestinian side to, to move ahead out of deadlock may actually uh, rise. My, being an Israeli, I think I, as an Israeli citizen, I can say that Israelis do want peace and they, uh, they vote in response to um, the signals they get regionally. And they don't see uh, much, uh, much in the way of a partner and much in the way of an encouraging regional environment. And if they did, I think voting patterns might change. And all these things might un unlock the situation. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, my name is Tanaka. I'm an uh, energy expert from Japan. I'm the EJ. Uh, thank you. I used to be the head of the International Energy Agency in Paris. Uh, it's an energy security forum. And uh, my concern has always been the Iranian crisis when the Israel attacks the Iranian nuclear facility. And this, this peace process is uh, related to the Israel action on Iran, or the other way around. Eventually, I think uh, the question is that this is a kind of risk which is inevitable to form the peace process in the future, or not. Or in, in, in the, I mean, the doctor, uh, let's say, reprints uh, economics is a very interesting one. Eventually, the EU may expand over to Turkey and then to the Arabs and Israel together. This kind of new Roman Empire could be the future solution eventually. I don't know. But before that, this kind of uh, risk of uh, crisis 
may be, uh, let's say, uh, imminent or not. And uh, my very specific question is, there is some speculation in the United States, and especially in Europe, that Iran may attack, Israel may attack Iran even before the summer. And what do you think about the probability of this question? Would you like to comment on that? I mean, but uh, I, I yeah. Well, maybe just just kind of a follow up on that question. Uh, uh, I don't think that Israel will attack Iran uh, this summer, as you say. Uh, I think that we are in a different, this is my opinion, it's pure speculation, of course, but we are in a different uh, uh, ball game now. Uh, and we do hear uh, that Iran is experiencing kind of a real uh, challenge when it comes to the socio-economic fold. I can tell you that there are voices coming from the past, the, the uh, Revolutionary Guards, uh, actually asking or even demanding the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei and others to just uh, reconsider the whole enrichment stuff because it has to do with the politics of survival and the well being of the Iranian population. I think that uh, uh, there is a change in 2012. The SWIFT sanctions. Uh, had been implemented uh, uh, almost two months ago, and uh, the, it's a different ball game now. And uh, there is no immunity. I mean, if the Iranians are not going to comply, there will be kind of a, it could be very pricey for them. I think that they got the message. Yes, there is China, there is Russia, and we know that. But I think that when it comes to the Iranian leadership, in my opinion. What they are practicing these days is kind of a politics of survival. And this is the real change from what we had before. So, uh, I mean, it still remains to be seen or asked what would be the economic ramifications of such an attack. But I really think that uh, who is running the show is President Obama for all means and purposes. Israel could just take kind of a comfort of that or saying that uh, the harsh, let us say, sanctions that are being implemented is kind of a byproduct of an Israeli threat to attack Iran. But, uh, I mean, uh, we know now that uh, this is kind of uh, saying that behind that, I don't think there is much now. And as my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Rivlin, actually put it loud and clear, there is two different, two different situations be before November and after November. I do agree that after November, actually, it's, it, it's going to be a different ball game. Maybe uh, cards are going to reshuffle. We'll have to wait and see. But since you talked about the coming summer, I thought that I should just uh, actually come up with kind of a saying that would maybe provide everybody, everybody with a sense of relief for the meantime, I would say. I also Please get the... the thing that, you again. know, all these threats to attack Iran or whatever, I think it's a tactical thing, basically, and I don't think an Israeli government will attack from simple reason. I don't think they would like to ignite the whole region because we've got Syria, and I think there the government is actually struggling for survival at this stage, and that would be like a rescue for them, an Israeli attack. On the other hand, we've got Hezbollah that will uh, obviously take advantage of such an attack, and I don't think you know, if you calculate the whole situation, I don't think that Israel will go ahead with this. I don't think they've got much to achieve. And uh, as Uzi mentioned, I think it's basically an international issue which was to be orchestrated by the United States and nobody else. And this is also my belief. Thank you. Please. So let's move to the second question. <laughs> yes, please. Um, so Kukin from uh, Korean National Diplomatic Academy of Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Republic of Korea. And I have a question to Dr. Levy um, uh, about the Israel-Palestinian relationship. So, there was a number of very um, crucial agreement, peace 
Pilgrimage and Onward from like, Camp David or Oslo and a couple of others too. And every time after the big, huge agreement, they go back to the, the original petition and the, we, experience, we experienced the collapse of the agreement. So um, what do you think that, um, which factor is the most crucial thing in, from your opinion to collapse all the agreements? And, um, and I was, I was linked linked the Israel-Palestinian case to the South North Korean negotiation, so I'm asking this question. So just let me know like which factors are crucial to collapse mm -hmm. the agreements. Okay. <clears throat> Actually there are uh, several controversial uh, issues between Israel and the Palestinians that may uh, bring to collapse uh, agreements and actually the same things are uh, the things that prevent uh, res resumption of uh, the final status negotiations between the two sides. Uh, for example, Palestinians uh, demand uh, a stop of building in the settlements uh, in order to prevent Israel from <coughs> Uh, changing the status quo in the uh, West Bank, the area which is uh, to be par part of the Palestinian uh, state. Israel claims that uh, it cannot stop the life of thousands and uh, hundreds and thousands uh, of people living there in the settlement. And once, if there is, uh, a settlement reached by the sites, uh, there will be no Israeli uh, settlements within the borders of the future uh, Palestinian state. Uh, another example is the Palestinian uh, demand uh, that negotiations will uh, be based on the 67 borders, uh, which uh, mean all of the West Bank, uh, but uh, Israel insists that uh, the borders will be determined uh, accordance with its needs uh, in security uh, manners and uh, uh, settlement uh, uh, needs. Uh, Israel demands uh, the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, the Palestinians say that they don't care uh, how Israel wants to de uh, define, it. define uh, itself, uh, they recognize the uh, very existence of uh, Israel and th that should be uh, uh, enough uh, for her. So there are many uh, kind of uh, uh, reasons that prevent both sides from being able to um, renew the uh, peace process, the talks, and uh, uh, there are many core issues uh, regarding the uh, final status uh, settlement, and each of them as Jerusalem and refugees and the borders can be uh, uh, difficult for both sides to make uh, the need uh, conscious, conscious concessions in order to reach uh, uh, an agreement. Yeah, I think that this is something that just to reemphasize what actually Dr. Lavi said in his presentation too. I mean, we have a lot of obstacles. If we would like to find out, actually, we're going to come up with kind of a real list of, uh, about things. Not only the heavy existential issues of Jerusalem, right of return and stuff, but as uh, Dr. Lavi said, there are some also logistic and technical problems still lie ahead and we have to think of that too. But basically, and this would be kind of a thing that we would like to deliver here, a two-state solution, one way or the other, should be and has to be a kind of a thing that both Palestinians and Israelis should think of. Because if not, we're going to have kind of a real problematic future. 
So, uh, I mean, uh, I think that this is something to be taken and this is uh, something that could be gleaned from uh, Dr. Lavi's presentation. I mean, we could talk a lot about how to promote peace, how to use economy in order to promote peace, and all, all, of, all of that actually is right to the point. But the basic thing is the punchline or the final analysis where we have to, or we have to come up with kind of what we call two-state solution for both, I mean, for the sake of both Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, you just mentioned that, and many in Israel even would argue that if this kind of uh, two-state solution is not being achieved, when having that in kind of, um, let us say, constructive dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians, some would even talk, as uh, we mentioned, about, let us say, uh, kind of a, a unilateral disengagement, as if to say, if this is something you cannot achieve via the negotiating table, you could actually just uh, put it as kind of reality and just uh, create kind of a division between both states. So uh, I agree. I mean, your, your question is right to the point, and uh, we have a lot of stuff to deal with. It just shows you how complex the situation is. But I think that at this time, this is what we need, a real sense of creativity of both sides to uh, compose or build up a real agenda with which to start actually moving toward kind of a more stable the reality. Actually, we need uh, brave leaderships, both yeah. sides. Mm. Sure. Good. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Eun Seok Chang, and I'm from Korea University. And um, I want to ask you about the international community's um, effort to mitigate the conflicts in Middle East areas. And when in 2006, I was quite shocked by the Israeli invasion into the Re Lebanon, and because there was no issue came up in this conference uh, between Israel, because Israeli and Lebanon conflict is quite, quite um, harsh one. Mm. But the best case would be this by these both part agree and make a peace accord and just make things, make things work very peacefully, but it cannot happen. And we have a United Nation in this earth, but at, at least on this Middle East case, United Nation has been a figurehead because, because, uh, because United States has always uh, expressed a veto in um, Security Council and they could not send um, military power to mitigate the conflict, then which kind of regional stakeholder or, or, or international actor that can help to mitigate conflicts when some crisis happens? I think that the in order to move peace process in the Middle East, we always have to go back to the formula, as I said, to the model that we had with Egypt. We can't conclude a peace treaty without the involvement of the United States. This is my feeling at the moment. It has to start with, actually, to mobilize the process. And I think when it comes to um, disputes that cannot be sorted out, cannot be resolved by the parties, then you need the kind of involvement of international bodies, the United Nations or others, which will try and mediate or try to find a solution to these particular issues, these particular disputes. I don't think that I don't think that the, the United Nations, I mean at this stage has got much to do in, as far as the Israeli Syrian conflict for instance is concerned. <coughs> But they played a very major role in the case of Lebanon uh, during the Israeli withdrawal in 2000. It's kind of to give it the legitimacy to the borders. They actually demarked the borders along. Uh, uh, so I think it, it really depends the stage of the conflict and the stage of the negotiation. And I think the United Nations and other international bodies definitely can play an important role. 
And as I mentioned in my presentation, the international arbitration during the Taba issue was quite important and basically solved a very important um, crisis that uh, could have actually led to uh, some adverse repercussions. My only general comment is that where there's a will, there's a way. Um, between Israel and Lebanon, there isn't the will, um, I mean, in the sense that Lebanon is not a, a state in control of its own territory. Um, there are all sorts of groups there that are seizing power, and so there isn't the will on the Lebanese side, although we do see elements of cooperation. I mean, I, I was reading about the Lebanese Navy cooperating somehow with the Israeli Navy to keep um, undesirable groups from attacking Israel's uh, northern shores, so one shouldn't, one shouldn't lose hope there. But it seems to me that um, there has to be will on both sides. I mean, just look at the, the border between Syria and Israel has been almost um, uh, peaceful, almost totally peaceful for, for so many years. Because, because there's a will on both sides as well as a, an effective force. Uh, in, uh, there may be differences in the, in the quality of some of these international groups. I think that um, Uzi is more of an expert on that than, than me. The, the UN forces, in, um, the UN forces in, in, between Israel and Syria have been much, much more effective than the, the type of organization you have in Lebanon. And then the other side is, of course, the example of the US um, forces that are in the Sinai. We, we have time for just one more question or comment, please, just, uh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't need money. You don't need money. I okay. I'm not getting it anyway. Thanks. I'll speak softer now. Um, I know this is about the Middle East and the Middle East peace process, but as some comments have revealed, it's more, of, it's a global issue. And as... Mr. La Labi at the yeah. far end, who gave us this sort of uh, trifled view of the peace process by the inner circle, middle circle, and outer circle. I wanted to perhaps ask if you could describe where countries like China and Russia fit into this equation, because I think they're important players insofar as they, according to my understanding, they serve as de facto guarantors of Iran. They, in the broad geopolitical context, they are backers of Iran. I, I think you mean to Dr. L uh, Rivlin that, that talked yes. about the circles, uh, yes. uh, but it still has to do with Russia and China. So, uh, I, I, I mean, I would say uh, um, that, you know, this is kind of, a, I agree with you, it's kind of a global game, definitely. But you have to ask yourself, while dealing with Russia and China, what they do have in front of their eyes while we are talking about Iran, while we are talking about Syria. One should bear in mind that there is no chance whatsoever that Russia, for example, would accept the notion of a Western intervention to Syria or toppling Bashar because Russia would not actually or could not live with the post-Bashar Syria, which is going to become much more convenient to Western interests. So you have to talk to the Russians. You have to talk to the Chinese. If the Russians would like to have kind of a, let us say, stronghold in the eastern flank of the Mediterranean, in Tartus, in Latakia, the port cities in uh, Syria, you have to actually secure that in order to make sure that they are on board too. So basically, it's kind of a tough game. I agree with you. A very cynical game. It comes at the expense of the suffering of many people in the Middle East. But this is how actually the international global game is being played at this stage. And we have to take it into consideration China. The same goes for China when it comes to Iran and economic uh, kind of uh, um, uh, interest and uh, incentives. So basically, uh, uh, I, I agree with you, but I would uh, think that you have to just uh, think that way too. And if you are toppling Bashar, 
I think that the Chinese would uh, ask themselves, what if tomorrow you would be of the opinion after having the Bashar president in, uh, president in mind, why won't we go for Tibet, for example? So I mean, just kind of an open question, but you have to be keenly aware of the different issues that both Russia and China have in mind while it comes to uh, actually kind of a joint um, initiative. Uh, I think that we are out of time. Thank you for attending this session. I think it was uh, a real good and very interesting one. And I know that there are many questions to be asked, but this would, uh, was meant to be just kind of a food for thought. We'll be very pleased to just keep contact. Thank you. Uh, let me thank our presenters. Good afternoon. We will now have a short break. The next session will start in 15 minutes. For your